Hey everyone, today we'll be looking into the life of an extraordinary suffragette, Emily Wilding Davison. During the early 20th century, the suffragette movement dominated British politics, as British women sought to acquire the vote and campaigned relentlessly for the same, and at times using violent methods. Emily Davison was a key figure in this struggle, and although many people have heard of the circumstances of her death or seen the footage, few people know her life story. Before we dive into her story, I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark. Surfshark VPN is an extremely useful service which has a wide range of benefits, but essentially it keeps you safe online and protects your personal data. I must admit, since I started using Surfshark, it has been extremely helpful as it's allowed me to unblock streaming services from other countries. So whenever I'm abroad or want to watch a series unavailable in my current location, Surfshark has me covered. Also, having Surfshark VPN is really the best way to protect yourself online. Few people know this, but public Wi-Fi can be dangerous as many hackers use these to steal personal information and financial data. This coupled with online companies selling data to third parties means having Surfshark VPN will keep your online information safe and avoid unwanted stress. I have to mention its clean web feature, which blocks ads, trackers, as well as malware and phishing attempts. It's really an essential tool in today's day and age. Best of all, they have a huge discount going on, so make sure to click the link in the description and use my code Forgotten Lives to get 83% off and an extra three months for free. Lastly, I just want to mention that Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee. So you should really try it out as there's nothing to lose. Be sure to click the link in the description so you can start protecting yourself online and enjoying all the perks that Surfshark has to offer. Emily Wilding Davison was born on the 11th of October, 1872 at Roxburgh House in Vanborough Park Road in Greenwich, South East London. She was the second of the three children of Charles Edward Davison, a retired merchant who was nearing his 50th year, and his second wife, Margaret Casely, who at 23 years old was less than half the age of her husband. Her father died in 1893, and thereafter, Emily's mother ran a shop in Longhorsley, in the north of the country in Northumberland. Her husband's financial affairs had become precarious later in life leaving Margaret and his children in difficult circumstances, a situation which was compounded by Charles having had numerous other children from his first marriage. Emily was educated in her earlier years by a governess, who resided at the family home at Gaston House, near Sawbridgeworth in Hertfordshire. She was subsequently sent to Kensington High School from 1885 to 1891, and then earned a bursary which allowed her to attend Royal Holloway College between 1891 and 1893. The death of her father and the financial woes which followed from it led her to acquire work in the mid-1890s as a governess, working in the homes of the British upper class. Here she acted as a childminder and attended to the educational needs of her charges. While working, she also found time to spend a term at St Hugh's Hall at Oxford University in the spring and early summer of 1895. It was one of her first major experiences of gender inequality. Despite achieving a first class honours in English literature, she was never awarded her degree, as at the time, women were excluded from receiving degrees and awards from the prestigious British University. Davison subsequently took up various positions teaching for a time at the Church of England College for Girls at Edgbaston in the city of Birmingham between 1895 and 1896, and then at Seabury School in West Worthing until 1898. Thereafter, she tutored privately while using the time to finally obtain the degree from the University of London in 1902, which had so unfairly been denied to her at Oxford in 1895. It was while working as a tutor in 1906 that Emily first became involved with the suffragette movement, when she joined the British Women's Social and Political Union, or the WSPU for short. The WSPU 
had been established in 1903 in the city of Manchester, in northern England, and the home of its first leader, Emmeline Pankhurst. It was set up to agitate and campaign for women to be given the right to vote in local and national elections in the United Kingdom. In the early 20th century, Britain was only partly democratic by modern standards. Women did not have the right to vote, and indeed, the vote had been heavily restricted amongst men for most of the 19th century. In 1800, only a small proportion of British males, those who had a certain amount of property or had a large amount of wealth, were allowed to decide who would be elected to the Parliament at Westminster in London. This was gradually extended in the course of the 19th century, culminating in the mid-1880s with the passage of the Representation of People Act in 1884 by the government of William Gladstone and the Redistribution Act of 1885, which cumulatively granted all adult males over the age of 21 the right to vote. However, women were still entirely excluded from the democratic process in Britain. The suffragette movement and the WSPU sought to redress this fundamental piece of gender discrimination. Following its establishment in 1903, the WSPU quickly became the leading organisation campaigning for women's suffrage in England. Its methods varied. On a more peaceful level, they organised marches and public demonstrations to draw attention to their cause, but their approach could often be much more confrontational. For instance, government buildings were vandalised and senior political figures were intimidated and even attacked by members of the suffragette movement. This did not go unpunished and as the years passed, dozens and even thousands of British suffragettes were being arrested in England and beyond. These prisoners would usually serve short prison terms, through which the British government hoped to make them desist from their course of action. This was the organisation which Emily Davison joined in 1906. A lifelong bachelorette who did not have any children, the suffragette movement quickly became her life-consuming passion. This occurred gradually, but by the summer of 1908, she was involved enough to act as a chief steward at the giant march which the WSPU organised to Hyde Park in London in June of that year, to draw attention to their cause. By 1910, she was officially employed by the Union, and was also writing for their media outlets, including the WSPU's official newspaper, Votes for Women. Most of her writings remained unpublished during her lifetime, but her essay entitled The Price of Liberty, which was published in 1914, revealed her ideological viewpoints. From this, it was quite discernible that Davison was a Christian feminist, one with a strong socialist leaning. Increasingly though, she gravitated towards the more militant wing of the party. On three separate occasions, she broke into and hid in the British House of Commons, the Parliament at Westminster in London. One of these acts in 1911 involved her hiding in a cupboard in the crypt chapel in order to avoid being counted as part of the national census, an illegal act during a census. Davison's ideological view here was clear. Well, if she wasn't counted as a citizen who could vote in national elections because she was a woman, then she should not be counted as part of the census. Other acts were more incendiary, some literally so. Davison, for example, was a pioneer within the suffragette movement in the art of setting fire to official post boxes as a form of civil dissent. On other occasions, she engaged in the obstruction of political events, stone throwing, window breaking, and even limited acts of assault on senior politicians. On one notable occasion in November 1912, she attacked an individual with a horsewhip, whom she had mistakenly believed was David Lloyd George, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Such antagonistic actions often brought her into confrontation with the leadership of the WSPU, and by the early 1910s, Davison was viewed as part of a more militant wing of the organisation. Her many acts of civil disobedience and incendiary political agitation did not go unpunished. Davison was imprisoned eight times, and on nearly all of these occasions, she went on hunger strike, 
an increasingly common tactic used by members of the suffragette movement and the WSPU. Again though, the British government escalated its own response once these hunger strikes became a regular feature of internment and began force feeding detainees, a barbaric practice which Davison experienced on several occasions. This led to her to barricade herself inside her cells on at least one occasion and even to attempt suicide in the spring of 1912 while detained at Holloway Prison in London by jumping from a 30 foot balcony. The injuries she sustained left her in discomfort for the remainder of her life, having damaged two vertebrae on her spine, but unbeknown to all at the time, she would be dead just a year and a half later. On the 4th of June 1913, Emily Wilding Davison attended the Epsom Derby in Surrey in southern England, one of the major annual horse racing events in Britain. The Epsom Derby was attended by much of high society at the time, and in the days before television was a good place as any to make a political point to wider society in England, and Davison certainly made one. During the main race, the Epsom Derby, as the horses neared the final stretch, Davison burst forth from the crowd onto the field carrying two flags, bearing the white and purple colours of the suffragette movement. She reached up to the reins of one of the passing horses, which was travelling at nearly 60 km per hour. The horse in question was called Anma, and was owned by King George V, who was watching along with Queen Mary from the stands. Emily's intention, it is believed, was to affix a suffragette and WSPU flag to the horse, so that it would wear it passing the finish line. But instead, the scene became a tragic one. The horse struck Davison with its chest and knocked her over, while toppling the jockey as well. She was subsequently taken to Epsom Cottage Hospital, but despite being operated on, two days later she never regained consciousness and died four days after the derby on the 8th of June from a fracture at the base of her skull. Davison's motives in running onto the racetrack at Epsom have been widely debated. Speculation has chiefly centred on whether she intended to simply attach the flag to the horse and then had assumed she would yet again be arrested, or whether this was an act of suicide, designed to make herself a political martyr. However, today it is widely believed that she did not intend to die. A 2013 documentary used digital methods to reconstruct three pieces of old video footage from the event, to show that her movements did not indicate that she intended to die. We also know that she had a return train ticket on her person to take her back to London that afternoon and had planned a holiday for shortly thereafter, hardly the actions of a woman who had tended to die at the derby. As such, it is now generally believed that Davison had intended to make a political gesture and then run back off the track. This though, never happened, and a political martyr of the suffragette movement was born instead. Although the wider British media was broadly unsympathetic towards her plight, Davison's funeral, which was held in London on the 14th of June 1913, attracted an enormous crowd. Over 50,000 people lined the route from Victoria to St George's Church in Bloomsbury, and onwards from there to King's Cross Station, where her body was sent north to Northumberland for burial. Following Emily's death, the suffragette movement quickly gained increasing support in British society. The First World War, saw support for women being given the vote rise sharply, as women played a key role in running British society as many men were sent to France to fight on the Western Front. This development, combined with the political pressure of Pankhurst and the suffragette movement in general, finally saw political reform towards the close of the war. In 1918, the Representation of People Act was passed in Great Britain. Through this, the vote was extended to women who were 30 years of age or older, but only if they were registered as property occupiers or married to one. Then when the Equal Franchise Act was passed in 1928, it granted equal voting rights to women and men, as both women and men could vote at the age of 21, and removed any income or property qualifications on women exercising the franchise. Thus, 
Britain's evolution into a full liberal democracy might finally have been said to be complete. In drawing national attention to the suffragette movement in 1913, Emily Wilding Davison played a highly significant role in this major moment in the development of Western democracy. Thank you so much for watching this video on Emily Davison, I hope you enjoyed If you did, be sure to leave me a like and a comment down below, and if you're new, why not subscribe? I hope you have notifications turned on so you get all my videos as soon as they're uploaded. And if you have any suggestions, be sure to leave them in the comments, or you can send them to my email or my Instagram, which are both in the descriptions. That's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Lives. Thanks.